The game has a cold open, with the Normandy being torn to shreds in its opening moments. Not only is the vessel that carries you through space destroyed, your more immediate and essential vessel, the one that your being resides in, is also destroyed. That is to say, Shepard dies. Unnecessarily convoluted metaphor out of the way, this is a really strong way to start the game. Having one of the most recognizable characters from your video game franchise meet their end right at the onset of the game is an undeniably memorable way to start the second game of your drawing franchise. The second most undeniably memorable thing to do, memorable for the wrong reasons this time, is to revive said character moments later. So Shepard dies after the attack on the Normandy, but their body is pieced together by Cerberus, the human supremacist organization from the first game. I have a lot of problems with this story right off the bat. While working with an organization whose views, hopefully, don't align with your own is an interesting premise, I'm sure that there could have been a better way of forcing Shepard into this agreement. Maybe, tired of being ignored by the council, Shep starts working with a shady contact who gives them endless resources. Maybe we do a few missions for the shady contact before realizing that they're Cerberus, being forced to work for them because we've already taken too many of their resources and now there's no turning back. Anything would be better than being literally resurrected like the second coming of Christ, returning from techno heaven through vaguely defined machinery. Shepard is treated as the second coming of Christ too. While in the first game, Shep was just a military operative who got in over their head, in this one they adopt more of a chosen one role. The head of Cerberus, known only as the elusive man, revives Shep because he thinks that they have something special that led to Sovereign's demise in the first game. The issue with this? Shepard wasn't alone. In fact, the whole point of the first game was that we worked with aliens from different races, combining efforts and uniting against a common threat. Since the other members of the Normandy crew survived, why wouldn't the elusive man approach them instead, try to assemble as much of the original team as he possibly could? Why would his first reaction be to literally try to bring somebody back to life? I suppose you could say that it's because, like companies that put up pride flags during Pride Month, his accepting attitude towards aliens is just a front, and he's so pro-human that he thinks that Shepard single-handedly did everything. This still doesn't explain why he wouldn't go to Caden first though. Plus, he has other non-humans as part of his dossiers. Wouldn't it make more sense to just focus on the less dead members of the Normandy's crew? If you're able to get past this really contrived plot, don't worry, it gets even more contrived later on. Never in this obscene a way, but contrived nonetheless. If it feels like I'm hating on the plot too much, it's mostly restricted to this section. I'm not a fan of chosen one narratives or of poorly explained plot devices like literal revivals. I could harp on about this all day, let's just accept that this is a terrible plot device, take it at its face value and move on. You wake up from your death-induced coma and start fighting your way through mechs because the Cerberus space you're in has been invaded. The change in combat is immediately noticeable. The guns feel so, so much better now and the aiming is more in line with what you would expect. Which is to say, the aiming reticule actually tells you where your bullets will go. The heat sinks that require you to stop shooting to let the guns cool down are also gone, replaced by traditional ammunition which needs to be picked up. The lower explanation for this makes little sense, but I am glad that this change was implemented. It incentivizes aggression. You're shooting at your own terms and you need to go right in your enemy spaces and steal ammo from them. There are a couple of weapon classes which play very differently, but there's little variety within these weapon classes. Another noticeable change is the omission of loot. There is no loot anymore and you're restricted to certain weapon types with little choice within them as I just mentioned, and the options that are presented are mostly stronger forms of the weapons you're currently carrying, which makes it a no-brainer to equip the best new thing you've unlocked, basically oversimplifying the already fairly simple system that was in place in the first game. This does also make it less tedious in the process. You no longer have to sift through tons upon tons of meaningless loot. Being able to wield only specific weapon types also makes sense from a class system perspective, but then why retroactively change it in ME1 for the remaster? The lack of loot is striking and its byproduct is a decreased sense of progression, even more so because of the revamped ability system, which requires more and more ability points the more you invest in abilities. This makes investing in skills more meaningful, but leveling up less so, since you will have to wait a while and go up a few levels before you can acquire the subsequent upgrades. 
I would have preferred if this game had less loot compared to Mass Effect 1, but loot that was more meaningful instead of having no loot at all. But this change comes across as jarring mostly because of how much loot there was in the previous title. Now, there are some weapons that are distinct from their other counterparts. Heavy weapons in particular change things up depending on the ones you have equipped. You can also find weapon upgrades, which we'll get back to later, and some other random weapons thrown about the battlefield. Another thing that this game lacks is some sort of summary of the main features of a weapon, like its damage output and unique features, presented in an at-a-glance view or something. You have to read through the full descriptions to get a proper picture of how each weapon works, and even then, it's not fully clear what their use cases are. The game also leans more heavily into the third-person shooter trends of the time. Your health now recovers automatically when you stay in cover, making unavoidable damage more acceptable since its effects can now be countered by just hiding behind things. Medigel is now required to use the Unity ability to revive squad mates, and while you can't heal using Medigel anymore, you can utilize class-specific abilities like Barrier or Tech Armor to guard against damage. You also have to press X to get into cover now, meaning that you're more in control of Shepard's actions in combat than you were in the original. This does come at a bit of a cost though, since you might just smack your face into a wall because Shepard decided to take cover while you were trying to run from one place to the next. Another integral part of combat in Mass Effect is the ability system, and I mentioned how squad leveling has been changed already. That's not the only change to abilities though, since all abilities share a common cooldown now. Might seem like a bad idea, but cooldown times are substantially reduced and you can become a total powerhouse, throwing out biotic shockwaves or setting enemies on fire in quick succession. The ability system is slightly more restrictive since there are fewer abilities that each squad member has access to this time around, one of which is locked till you complete their loyalty mission, but this does give each squad member a unique feel in combat. Making the choice of who will be in your squad is more deliberate this time around for more reasons than just the change to abilities though. You can also set up biotic ability synergies if you use compatible skills like pull and throw at the same time to some hilarious effect, made even better by the fact that you can tear the limbs of your enemies clean off. You'll also be playing what is essentially a game of rock, paper, scissors, since different enemy defenses such as armor, shields, barriers, and health have different weaknesses which need to be exploited to effectively deal with them. If you don't tailor your squad to deal with each of these diverse defenses, you'll find yourself in a battle of attrition rather than skill. For example, I almost always had Morton on my squad since his incinerate ability ate through enemy armor in no time. I also kept Miranda with me a lot of the time since no enemy barriers were a match for her heavy warp. That's another thing about the leveling system. Once you reach the final tier of any ability, you can choose between turning the ability into an AoE or increasing its damage output. Again, you will want to make sure to balance your squad out in such a way that you have enough AoE options to deal with crowds, while also having sufficient heavy hitters to take care of the stronger enemies. You do have less control over your squad mates now. You don't decide who they attack, just who they use their powers on. This, and the fact that you can map abilities to different buttons to use them without having to open the ability wheel first, are both efforts to streamline the combat, and each of these additions, or subtractions, come with their own pros and cons. Another example of this streamlining is the leveling system. I swear this is the last time I'll bring it up. For now. The charm and intimidate options have been completely removed, and so have passive abilities like decryption. This takes away from the RPG feel of the game, making it feel more action-oriented. Each squad member also has their own class bonus which can be upgraded, and these upgrades are essentially no-brainers if you want to give your squad a chance to survive. Moving through the Cerberus facility, there was another thing that I realized. The HUD was much busier than it was in the last game. Instead of having a small pop-up tell you that you had earned credits or Paragon or Renegade points, there's a giant tab which shows up to give you this information. It's unnecessary and intrusive, but you will eventually get used to it. Additions to the HUD that I do appreciate are the area maps and objective markers. While in hub worlds like Omega, you'll be given proper area maps, missions provide you with objective markers that you can bring up by pressing the left stick in that show you exactly where to go. This was a glaring omission in the first game, and it's even more important to have something like this in the second one, 
considering the larger scale of the areas that you go to. This addition is greatly appreciated, and the fact that it's done in such a subtle way is fantastic. There are also subtle indications that your abilities have recharged, and there are even ones for the status of your squad, meaning that you don't have to open the ability radial each time you want to check whether or not you can use one or not. Another complaint I had with Mass Effect 1 was the lack of a proper indication that you had finished your mission. In this game, there's almost always an ending cutscene, indicating that you've finished a quest, and this is followed by a mission complete screen. We'll talk more about how exploration works in this game later on, but the only reason why such a screen even exists is sort of tied to the limited exploration options. I like having a mission summary, but it does make the game feel more linear than it actually is. A complaint that isn't resolved is related to the minigames, the lack of variety in them to be exact. The game does ease it up a little bit. There's two main types of minigames now, one which involves matching patterns and the other one which involves matching symbols. Different, yeah. Once again, they're repeated way too often, and the only other minigame I can think of is a one-off on Tuchanka that has you kill space monkeys. Plus, there's no Omnigel to allow you to bypass these minigames anymore, a fact that Liara and Shepard reference in one of the DLCs. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back on the facility, you come across Jacob. The less said about him, the better. You also eventually meet Branda, the woman who has been heading the project which sought to bring you back to life. She seems quite stuck up, and she's basically a British Illuminati agent. But I grew to appreciate her character a lot more as the game went on. Wish I could say the same about Jacob though. Anyway, you eventually make your way up the infiltrated base and meet up with the elusive man, who tries to convince you that Cerberus isn't as terrible as it once was. The twisted morality of working with Cerberus makes the plot more tense. You never know if you can fully trust them or even if you would want to, but you are still forced to follow their orders since the fate of the universe depends on it. The new council still doesn't believe you and you have no other choice than to use the resources offered to you by Cerberus to try and take down the big bad of this game. All you know about the aforementioned big bad just now is that they're called the Collectors and that they have been abducting humans from colonies for some unknown reason. To investigate this, you have to take Miranda and a wet blanket to one such colony to find out what happened. The colony is eerily empty, overrun with defense mechs. You come across Tari here, who questions your decision to work with Cerberus. Trust me, Tari, I wouldn't be doing it if I had a choice. You find another Quarian who tells you about the invaders who took everyone away here, and after another meeting with the elusive man, you get access to the new Normandy, which finally opens up the galaxy for you to explore. Just like the last game, you explore the galaxy using the galaxy map aboard the Normandy. Unlike the last game, the galaxy map isn't as much of a frustrating mess anymore. For one, each cluster has a list of missions which you can find in its system listed under it. This makes the map busier, but also makes it so that you don't have to repeatedly quit out of the map to open the journal and then test your short-term memory each time you want to start a certain mission. Moving around the map is also made more interactive since you're now represented within each system as a small model of the Normandy, which you must freely move around from planet to planet. If you want to move from one system to the other within a cluster, you will need to expend fuel. Run out of fuel and you'll have to use some consumable resources instead. How do you get resources, you ask? Through excessive tedium, of course. Look, I don't think that anybody understands how happy I was when I realized that the Mako had been removed completely. What replaces it isn't an improvement though. Now you go to each planet, get some lore, and then you get to scan these planets for resources or anomalies, which are essentially side missions. You need to slowly rotate the planet using the scanner to find resources, which you can then put towards some really valuable upgrades. This whole scanner thing is fun for about the same amount of time as it takes for Shepard to slap a reporter in the face. It's novel the first few times that you do it, but you're expected to do the same thing over and over again. What makes this worse is that the probes that you use to extract resources are themselves a limited resource. There's only one place in each cluster where you can buy these probes. Note that I said cluster and not system. You need to go back to that specific system which contains a fuel depot if you ever run out of probes, before returning to wherever you were when you ran out of the damn things. Again, this isn't as bad as the Mako sections, but it isn't a substantial improvement either. I've debated putting this section after the start of Act 2, but I think it flows better with their discussion about the galaxy map. Exploration in this game is limited to side missions. This is why mission end screens make sense here. The side missions are more linear than they were in the first game, 
acting as self-contained vignettes instead of galaxy-spanning arcs. On the plus side, the painstakingly boring planetary exploration is gone. These linear missions also have unique layouts and more environmental variety than the side missions in the first game. They are also, unfortunately, less memorable. For most of the end 7 quests, you have to come across anomalies on random planets by chance, and once you do, you just have to kill things over and over. Decision making is de-emphasized, and the mission objectives get repetitive and boring real quick. I did exactly 5 unexplored planet missions. No more, no less. This was the exact number that was required to do for one of the trophies. I just could not be bothered to scan so many different planets to be rewarded with more of the same combat encounters repeatedly. The missions on the hub world generally fare much better since they allow you to roleplay more. The main story is quite combat heavy on its own and these missions provide a suitable change of pace. Two side missions stood out to me. The first one involved a quarian being wrongfully accused of stealing a credit chip by a Volus and an incompetent CSEC officer on the Citadel. This was resolved by me locating the credit ship, helping the quarian, and then intimidating the Volus and CSEC officers into being less racist. The other had me go to a derelict space station whose AI freaked out and needed to be shut down. Not only does slowly learning about the fate of the humans aboard the ship through data pads and voice notes add a feeling of dread, solving some simple puzzles as you work your way to the AI core adds gameplay variety too. Overall, the side quests are mostly disappointing, but there are some exceptions to the rule. There might have been more interesting plot lines than the ones I just mentioned, but I wasn't willing to trust to the dribble to just get to them. Mass Effect 2 is a collectathon of people. I know how ridiculous that sounds. How can an RPG be a collectathon? But the game's structure resembles that of a collectathon to a T. There are very few proper main missions which progress the story. These missions must be unlocked by first collecting a specific number of companions. Companions whose bios are presented to you by the elusive man in the form of dossiers. You don't need to get all of these companions on your team, but like any good collectathon, Mass Effect 2 incentivizes collecting all the companions. In this game, if you don't get enough squad mates and successfully attain their loyalty, you're going to be at a disadvantage in the final mission. The entire game is building up to the suicide mission, and your proclivities as either a completionist or not determine whether or not this mission lives up to its name. Before we get to the loyalty missions though, we need to start populating the Normandy. Something that I really like about this game is that the more peripheral Normandy crew, like the engineers, have their own unique dialogue trees. It's fun to talk to them, but they don't really get more dialogue later in the game. Another thing about the Normandy that reiterates the squad gathering aspect of the game is how certain sections are blocked off till you recruit the appropriate crew member who will take up residence in that area. Even one of the core progression systems, the upgrade hub, is locked till you recruit Morden. Before I went to Omega to recruit Morden in a bit to enable the upgrade hub at the earliest, I made two pit stops. The first of these had me go to the original Normandy's crash site. This is a DLC mission which has been seamlessly integrated into the base game. It basically has you pick up a few dog tags while you reminisce about the OG Normandy and its crew. I love this little send off to Mass Effect 1, 10 out of 10 DLC should have been a part of the base game to begin with. The second stop was the Citadel. Here I caught up with Anderson and was denied Spectre status by the new council. I think they were just afraid that if they gave me power, I'd do to them what I did to their predecessors. I've talked about my favorite side quest aboard the Citadel already, but there's one more aspect to it that I need to touch on. The Citadel has been massively scaled down since the first game. Instead of having the liberty to go to the wards and the Presidium areas, you're instead relegated to what is essentially a giant shopping mall. The contrast between the upper class and the lower class on the Citadel isn't a major theme anymore. Well, not as far as gameplay goes. But there is some hilarious commentary on capitalism and advertising which I did appreciate. After restraining myself from slapping a reporter across the face for a second time, I made my way to Omega to pick up Morden. I was hoping to kill two birds with one stone here since a vigilante known only as the Archangel was also on Omega. After landing on Omega, I realized why the Citadel had been so limited. There are three main hub areas in Mass Effect 2. The Citadel, naturally, acts like one, 
but so do omega and ilium. Each of these hub areas are also fairly distinct from each other. Omega tackles the seedy underworld themes. Ilium provides a stark contrast as a business hub with its shiny exterior hiding clandestine dealings, and the Citadel focuses mainly on CSEC, but acts somewhat like a middle ground between the two. Back on Omega, we are summoned by the HBIC, an Asari called Arya Talok, and I love everything about her. Learning of her rise as the supreme ruler of this crime-ridden planet is fascinating. One thing that I adore about her character is how she isn't portrayed as being soft at her core. If you help her out, she'll trade favors, but she won't spill her guts to you and tell you her tragic backstory like many other villains would. There's some side quests to do on here. The most interesting one involves getting a bad drink from a bartender and setting him right. But once you're done messing around in the nightclub, you can make your way to either Morden or the Archangel. Morden's recruitment mission involves making your way through hordes of enemies to spread the cure of a pandemic which residents of the slums believe humans to have spread. You can also thoroughly traumatize Morden's assistant in the process. When I first met Morden, I fully expected him to fall into the trope of the socially inept savant. Little did I know that he was going to end up becoming my favorite squad mate. Not only is his incinerate ability able to eat through armor like nobody's business, he's also the cutest and funniest being aboard the Normandy. Add to this the moral dilemma about the Krogan genophage and his role in its invention, as well as the fact that he literally sings a song from a musical for you, and it's hard to beat the charm of this lovable Salarian ally. The other recruitment mission is that of the Archangel, the sharpshooter vigilante who's united all the factions of the galaxy because of how many of each of their recruits he has killed. The factions themselves don't play a substantial role in the story. Your interactions with them are limited to shooting each of their members in the face, no question asked. But the fact that they're working together to take him out shows just how prolific of a killer he is. You can make the ending section of this mission easier for yourself by sabotaging the factions. A nice little touch. Once you're done doing that, you can shoot through the faction members who are trying to get to the Archangel and finally unmask him. And the Archangel is handsome boy Garrus and he's back with a butt shot. I've heard people say that it's contrived that you would run into your old squad mates all the time. But honestly, it makes perfect sense that the Normandy's original crew would go on to take up some of the most important positions in the galaxy. Garrus's recruitment mission is basically a tower defense game which ends in a fight against a gunship boss. A fight which is repeated a total of three times in this game. The mission ends with Garrus getting an injury to his face. But the scars only make him more perfect if you ask me. Another little thing that the game does that goes a long way is that it puts you back on the Normandy when you finish a mission, reducing backtracking in the process. Also, I know that I've been thirsting for Garrus a lot, but his character in this game is severely nerfed. He frequently doesn't want to talk to Shepard, and I wish that he had more stories from his days as a vigilante to share. The initial banter with him when you get back on the Normandy is delightful though. Now that we've unlocked the research terminal, I suppose it's time to talk about the equipment side of progression. There are a few different categories of upgrades that you can find, which require you to pick up schematics from stores or through exploring the areas that missions take place in. You must then use resources to implement these upgrades. Most of these upgrades are simple stat boosts to your weapons or armor, or to your squad's weapons or armor. But there are some prototypes which unlock all new weapons or unique armor sets. The weapons that you can unlock through this are mostly heavy weapons though. There are quite a few armor sets however, and they not only look badass but also give you certain stat boosts. You can also acquire individual armor pieces and mix and match to create your own set. This also allows you to make your armor hot pink and makes kissing people less awkward since you won't be doing it through a helmet, but I personally just stuck to one of the presets. Sorry Yara, I hope you like the taste of glass. There's another additional upgrade type, the Normandy upgrades. These don't usually have any direct gameplay benefit, but you'll still want to implement all Normandy upgrades that your engineer class crewmates recommend, since these play a role in the suicide mission as well. There's two more crewmates for us to pick up before the next story beat. The first of these is Jack, a biotic psychopath who's behind bars on a space station. Aboard this interstellar prison was where I realized just how cinematic this game truly was. Sweeping camera angles give you a picture of the sheer scale of this prison, but its warden tells you all about it. 
He then decides to try and trap you in one of the stupidest plot twists in this game and you have to fight your way out of the prison. I believe that this is also where I realized that the pyro enemies are completely broken. Get caught in their flamethrower blasts and you'll be stun locked to death. On your way out of the prison, Jack will decide to join your team. Right off the bat, you can tell that her main focus is survival. The game does a good job of characterizing each of its characters and Jack is no exception. Done wrong, Jack would have big, not like other girls or non-binary stereotype energy. And while I don't think that she falls into either of these camps, there are some issues with her quest time which I'll discuss when we talk about her loyalty mission. With that, we are off to recruit our final crewmate for now. To complete this task, we have to go to the Krogan homeworld of Tchanka, where we end up acquiring a Krogan and a giant test tube. We can decide to keep the Krogan locked up in that test tube if we want, but he's funny enough to warrant his release from his cylindrical prison. Grunt isn't my favorite squad mate because of how one-dimensional his character is, but there's no denying the hilarity in his ceaseless aggression. Once you've collected enough people, the galaxy map gets logged and you're forced to land on the human colony of Horizon, which is midway through a mass abduction. You get to fight through waves of collectors. Their insect-like appearance makes me extremely uncomfortable, but they're fairly standard enemies. Occasionally, one of them will be possessed by the Harbinger and become stronger. There are also these Keons whose poorly telegraphed attacks take your shield out in one hit. Make your way through these enemies and you'll be greeted by Caden, who doesn't want to work with you because you're associated with Cerberus. This immediately gives him more characterization than any of his actions during the first game, but it also makes him more annoying. Bold of him to assume that I'd want him on my team anyway. With that, it's time to complete the roster of teammates for this game. I'll be talking about the respective loyalty missions of each member of your team when I talk about their recruitment missions, since at this point, there's little delay between recruiting them and unlocking those loyalty missions. The first of these that I tackled was Kasumi's. Kasumi is a DLC character, a fact that's apparent from the lack of a proper recruitment mission. As a master thief though, she's a really fun character to have on the team, and her loyalty mission has you go to a rich guy's mansion to steal something from him. I enjoyed the initial part of this mission, where you get to roleplay as James Bond, sneaking around the opulent house of this man, trying to disable the security systems. The mission lacks any semblance of depth though, since it basically does all the hard work for you. It's very on rails, and it ends in a combat section, which there's no way to avoid. Imagine how much better this mission would be, where, if you did things just right, you could steal the items from right under the guy's nose without him ever knowing that you were even there. A failure to do things right could still result in combat, but the loyalty mission of a master thief shouldn't force you to fight your way to the treasure. The story of Kasumi's loss is heartfelt though, but since you can't properly interact with her once this mission is over, you don't get to see the full ramifications of letting go of the ghost of her past lover. The setup of this mission is my favorite one, but it so massively drops the ball when it comes to execution. Samara's loyalty mission provides a glimpse into what this mission should have been. The second loyalty mission I attempted was Saeed's. I don't particularly like Saeed's. I think he's just a boring mercenary and his revenge-oriented loyalty mission didn't tickle my fancy either. There's interesting use of environmental hazards to take out large groups of enemies here, but story-wise, there's little of interest. This mission did point out the lethal flaw of this game's loyalty system though. I decided that the lives of the innocent workers were more important than Zaid's thirst for revenge, and I expected this to result in me losing his loyalty. Instead, the squad screen showed that I did somehow gain his loyalty, despite his very apparent anger at my decision. Loyalty is tied almost exclusively to loyalty missions, and very few of these loyalty missions have fail states. Out of the four that do, Three of these fail states are triggered depending on the decisions that you make, and the last one depends on your ability to follow a target. Out of the three that are decision dependent, two do not require you to make any sort of difficult decision if you have a high enough Paragon or Renegade rating. See, in Zaid's quest, I was able to talk him into being loyal by using my high Paragon score to persuade him. In Tali's quest, a similar situation arose where I was forced to make a difficult decision, but since I had a high enough Renegade rating, I chose to take the easy way out. I hate that this is an option at all. And this isn't even the only situation in which having a sufficient Paragon or Renegade score can get you out of trouble. After you complete the loyalty quests of certain pairs of crew members, they'll end up getting in a fight. Choosing one will result in you losing the loyalty of the other, 
But using the Paragon or Hericade options will result in the end of the infighting and you'll retain the loyalty of both members. And even if you do choose between them, it's still possible to use the same skill check to win back the loyalty of the member you upset. How did we go from being forced to decide between which crew member lives and dies in the first game to having two options which basically act as a I don't want to decide button? There should be fail states for each loyalty quest and even for some recruitment quests. The decision of which squad mate you back should be a difficult one. There should be a neutral option independent of your Paragon and Renegade points, but losing the loyalty of your team shouldn't be as difficult as it is. The binary morality system just does not work for this game. Since you're literally in a morally grey area right from the start, considering that you're allying yourself with a human terrorist group. The Paragon and Renegade conversation options can never seem to make up their mind on whether a Paragon would bow to authority, or oppose human supremacists and having skill checks tied to how many of each individual type of points you have makes zero sense as a result. What further complicates things is the QTE interrupt system which doesn't even tell you what Shep is going to do, just that it will be a paragon or a renegade action. Sometimes it's easy to tell what's going to happen from the context clues. Other times though it absolutely isn't and it oversimplifies the already oversimplified system. God, it makes such little sense. Your face also changes and makes you look more like a sci-fi demon if you stray too far on the renegade path. This makes absolutely zero sense, but I think it looks cool and the effect can be reversed, so it's probably the only acceptable part of this morality system. This last complaint isn't exactly about the paragon renegade mechanics, but it is about the dialogue wheels, so I'll mention it here. Pressing square skips dialogue lines, but it also results in selection of a dialogue option. This means that you'll sometimes be pressing square repeatedly and select a dialogue option by mistake. This could be fixed so, so easily. Just make it so that selection of a dialogue choice is restricted to pressing X. My primary frustration with the game lies mostly in how poorly the morality system is handled. In the first one, it made little sense. In this one, it actively hinders the player's experience by not allowing them to fully engage with the role-playing side of things. But that's enough about the deplorable dialogue wheel. Let's get back to the loyalty missions. Jack's mission sees you destroy the Cerberus facility where she was held and tortured as a kid to harness her biotic potential. Like I said, Jack doesn't fit into the not like other girls trope, but she does fit into the broken psychopath who the universe wronged one. Her crime stories are fantastic though, and there is something cathartic about destroying the Cerberus space. I will say that I might have taught Jack the same murderous lesson that I taught Garrus in the first game, but come on, that guy deserved it. There was something that I didn't like about how Jack's character is handled. After a certain point, despite me making it extremely clear that I wasn't romantically interested in her, she got offended that I was hooking up with Miranda and refused to talk to me because of this. I don't know if I made some wrong dialogue choices that led to this, but I think I made it very clear that I just cared for her as a friend and it still resulted in me being shunned from her place in the engineering hold. Morton's loyalty mission is nothing special, but it does force him to confront the moral implications of, of launching a literal genophage on a species. Grant's loyalty mission also takes place on Tochanka and it involves him going through a Krogan coming of age ceremony. You get to fight a Thresher more, but this throwback is about the most interesting part of this mission. You can also run into Rex on Tochanka, but he refuses to join your team because he's too busy saving his species or something. So self-absorbed. Jacob's mission sees you finding his father who has been presumed dead. If you thought Jacob was bad, which he is, God Jacob stop being such a suck up. His father is significantly worse. He made use of the debilitating health of his stranded crew members to essentially enslave them. I ended up giving Jacob Sr. the choice to take his own life before the authorities arrived, which he promptly did. The mission itself was fine, but Jacob is Caden and Alenko levels of annoying, with the difference being that Caden at least had an interesting backstory in the first one. For Miranda's loyalty mission, we have to go to Ilium. There's quite a few points of interest here. You can help out the people of the zoo's hope colony and get a small message from the Rachni Queen as well. You also run into Liara, who we'll be talking about more in the DLC section. Miranda's mission involves saving her twin sister. Miranda was genetically synthesized by her father to be perfect, and she wanted her sister to have a better life than she did, so she helped her escape from the man. Her sister's cover is nearly blown, and Miranda must make sure that her father doesn't find her. I love Miranda's arc. 
She initially comes across as a hard ass, but you get to see her more vulnerable side in a way that feels organic. I do find it hard to believe that Miranda would trust anyone but herself to transport her sister, but the final interaction between her and her sister makes the plot inconsistencies worth it. On Ilium, we can also find Samara and Thane. Samara is an Asari Justicar. Her strong moral code makes her intimidating, but it's her biotic prowess that makes her fearsome. I alluded to her loyalty quest being exceptionally good. This is because, unlike most loyalty quests which just turn into combat gauntlets, hers involves gathering intel on her daughter, an Asari Black Widow, and has you acting in a certain way to lure her out so that Samara can end her once and for all. Not only is learning about the enigmatic Ardit Yakshi and Asari Justicars enriching in and of itself, the way that the quest forces you to use the dialogue wheel in a creative way to get what you want adds a new layer to the gameplay that I wish was explored more elsewhere. You can also choose Samara's daughter over Samara and recruit her instead, but you'd be missing out on Reeve, the best ability in the game. Not only does it sap enemies' health like nobody's business, it also restores a chunk of your own. This was the ability that I gave to Shepard through advanced training, and it made a lot of missions towards the end a breeze. The other companion you can recruit here is Thane, an assassin with a moral compass. Thane is a drill, an alien race which we haven't come across before. Although his spirituality can come across as a bit heavy-handed and even hypocritical, owing to his job as an assassin, it's still great to learn more about this new race and their unique memory system. And I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a benevolent assassin on the team, but can he please stop turning into the Riddler? His quest involves stopping his son from following in his footsteps, because Thane is that father who went to get milk and never came back. I like that the father-son issues aren't resolved through a single conversation, but Thane's mission is very boring gameplay-wise and just has you running around the Citadel. Between Thane and Jacob, though, we have the full experience of messed up father-son dynamics. Speaking of people you want to call daddy, Garrus' loyalty quest involves taking revenge on the guy who sold his vigilante group out to the factions. Once again, this resulted in me reinforcing the message that murder is good, but I'm glad that I could help the handsome boy out in some way. The final crewmate left to pick up is Tali. I loved Tali in the first game, and this one improves her character even more. After you help her on a planet with a very ambitious son, which is also overrun by Geth, she decides to join your team. Her loyalty quest takes you to the Quarium Flotilla. The concept of this migrant fleet piqued my curiosity in the first game, and watching it in action while taking part in its politics in this one delivers on that setup. The subplot about the Geth Quarian fight for the Quarian's native planet is something I'm hoping to learn more about in the next game too. Fighting through a ship to learn the truth behind Tali's father's death makes for an exemplary plot, but the fact that you can just scream at the politicians to forgive Tali without having to make the tough decision of presenting or concealing the truth about her father's experiment is a major letdown. Progressing the main quest doesn't require you to complete loyalty missions or even resolve all dossiers for that matter, so once you're ready, you can board the seemingly abandoned collector ship. Here, ship gets access to one more weapon class. The ship resembles a hive and it's very disconcerting. To nobody's shock, the ship was not abandoned and this was indeed a trap. Now you must fight your way past the collectors to return to Normandy. You do learn that the collectors are an evolved, indoctrinated form of the Protheans, a twist that caught me completely off guard. Anyway, return to the Normandy and you can trigger the final act of the game by initiating the mission to acquire the Reaper IFF. The Reaper IFF mission is possibly my least favorite in the entire game. You just fight your way through hordes of husks, trying to get to the IFF. A Geth, donning part of the N7 armor, appears to be helping you as you make your way through the deactivated Reaper, but you'll have to wait till after you have obtained the IFF to properly interact with them. By this point, I had seen everything that the game's combat had to offer, so being forced into combat with so many enemies was an annoyance more than anything. Even the final boss of this area is a slog. You shoot at the reaper's score as it just takes your abuse. Fire enough shots and the core will stop taking damage and you'll be forced to fight yet more husks who can stun lock you if you're not careful. The only good thing to come from this mission is Legion. Legion is the most unique crew member of them all. As a member of the guest collective, he provides answers to questions you probably didn't even know you had about how the guest hive mind works. 
Even his loyalty quest focuses on the collective intelligence of the Geths. There's a group of defaulters, Geth heretics, whom you must take down. You can choose to override their intelligence, essentially taking away their free will. But the only other alternative is blowing their entire ship up. I like this moral dilemma and Tali's own perspective on it. And while I'm still left with many questions about the Geth and about Legion's functioning, I appreciate being given a new perspective on the sentient AI race that I spent the entirety of the first game fighting. Between Legion and Tari's respective loyalty missions, we have more perspectives on the Get debate than we could have ever hoped to have in the first game. I won't say that these perspectives humanize the Geths, far from it, but the idea of eradicating them entirely feels much more sinister now than it did in the first game, where they were mostly treated like machines, unless you completed some specific side quests which gave them more character, that is. With that, it's time to use the Omega 4 relay and take out the collector threat once and for all. Before we do that, we need the IFF to be installed. Completing any mission and then interacting with the galaxy map triggers a pseudo point of no return. Your entire squad leaves the Normandy for some reason, and when you return, it turns out that the collectors have abducted the rest of the crew. It's a bit heavy handed. I mean, why did the entire squad decide to leave when you usually just choose two members to come with you and leave the rest behind? But it allows for a pretty tense sequence to play out and an equally tense timer to be activated. You can do other missions, but your crew members will die if you don't proceed to the actual point of no return, the Omega 4 relay. And with that, it's time to talk about the most interesting and potentially most flawed part of the game, the suicide mission. But first, an awkward sex scene with Miranda. Once you're done fornicating, Joker takes the ship through the relay and to the collector base. This is where doing loyalty missions pays off. You need to make decisions about which members of your team you're going to assign to different tasks. For example, you need a tech specialist right when the mission begins, and later you'll need to select a biotics expert to hold up a barrier. While the choice of which companion to assign to each task is generally glaringly obvious, with one exception that I'll mention in just a moment. The survival of said companions or their teams that they're a part of depends on whether or not you have their loyalty, as well as some Normandy upgrades. There's a base defense score that each teammate has, which, along with their loyalty status, determines their fate. The loyalty system is lacking for reasons I've already laid out, but in the context of the suicide mission, there were a lot of different metrics which should have been implemented to measure the survivability of your squad. For one, the amount of time or number of missions that each member spends on your party should have been taken into consideration. Specific weapon or prototype upgrades for squad members should also have played a role. I do recognize that such systems would take a lot of time and resources to implement, but as it stands, completionists are rewarded for doing the loyalty missions and getting upgrades, and meaningful decision making and having actual interactions with your squad are de-emphasized. Nothing exemplifies this better than the exception that I mentioned earlier. You have to decide on a fighting leader. Initially, Miranda seems like the obvious choice. She was leading the Cerberus operatives who brought you back to life after all. But when it comes to making the choice, Jack very blatantly states that she opposes Miranda's leadership. If you choose to disregard Jack's objection and instate Miranda as the lead anyway, there are absolutely no consequences. I refuse to believe that the hot-headed Jack wouldn't disobey Miranda and potentially get herself killed in the process. Maybe this would make more sense if there was any indication that resolving the dispute between Miranda and Jack earlier had affected their relationship, but that's just not the case. Listening to your teammates doesn't seem to matter that much in the suicide mission. It's a missed opportunity, and while I love how unique this whole setup is, there's no denying that it's also extremely underwhelming in its execution. The resolution of the plot itself isn't without fault either. As you fight your way through the collector base in what is admittedly an interesting arena, you finally discover the reason behind the abductions. And it is… well, it's kind of funny if you ask me. The collectors have been turning people into… there's no good way to say this. They were turning the abducted humans into genetic fury so that they could inject what they believed to be the essence of humanity in the form of chromosomal fluids, not that kind, into a giant human-shaped reaper. This is the most complicated form of IVF I have ever seen. It feels like the more we learn about the reapers, the less intimidating they get. This whole human reaper reveal literally feels like a bad Scooby-Doo unmasking. You get to engage in battle with the human reaper. The more I say the name, the more it sounds like a bad heavy metal band. 
What were they even thinking? This boss fight is not the worst that the series has to offer. You alternate between shooting the human sorbet injecting tubes, waves of collectors and Ennard himself till eventually you're defeated and get to make one final decision, whether or not you want to destroy the collector base. I decided to leave the base in Cerberus' hands. I might not like Cerberus, but letting all of this stuff go to waste seemed like a terrible idea. Once this was done, Shepard returned to Normandy for one last victory lap. Or they could also die, because apparently Shep can die twice in the same game and still come back for the sequel. I'll keep this part brief since I've already described most of my complaints with how the loyalty system and suicide mission were handled. The beginning and ending of the plot are both incredibly weak and we do little to impede the reaper threat in the grand scheme of things. As a self-contained story, Mass Effect 2 fares well, if you're fine with the emphasis on its characters, that is. The story structure revolves entirely around the squad and if you don't care for interacting with them and learning more about them, I don't see you deriving any sort of fun from this game. Mercifully, the characters are all multi-dimensional and their stories are truly engaging. The morality of pledging allegiance to Cerberus also adds to the tension, but there are quite a few contrivances which some people will be more sensitive to than others. We still have one more thing to talk about before we wrap it up though. An aspect of the game that felt like an afterthought in the first one. An aspect that feels like anything but in this one. We still have to talk about Mass Effect 2's DLC. Apart from the return to the Normandy mission that I've talked about, and some DLC armors and weapons, there are three main DLC packs. The first of these introduces a Mako-like vehicle that fares much better than that stupid drone. I didn't do every single mission of the Firewalker pack because it felt like tagged on content for the sake of content, and the Hammerhead itself makes an appearance in a more capable DLC pack, Project Overlord. Project Overlord leans heavily into the sci-fi genre. You're forced to navigate some endlessly creepy Cerberus labs where they've been attempted to interface with the guest network to gain control over them. After going through some sections straight out of a horror movie, you discover that the autistic brother of the head researcher had been tortured physically and mentally. You can rescue the boy and send him off to live with the X-Men. This DLC was fantastic across the board. The hammerhead is much less aggravating to control than the Mako could ever hope to be, and its use in platforming sections provides a nice change of pace from the combat that you engage in in some truly horrifying environments. And although having no dialogue lines for your companions is extremely uncanny, I highly recommend playing through this vignette nonetheless. The Lair of the Shadow Broker pack is also excellent. It introduces a tech noir theme and gives you a deeper insight into what exactly happened to Liara in the two years that you were gone for. Considering how long the Asari lived though, two years is not a lot of time. And the radical change in Liara's character from naive scientist to cold hard information broker is kinda contrived. Still, you do get to see her take up the post of the Shadow Broker, which is a fantastic resolution for her arc. You can also continue her romance on the Shadow Broker base. Also on the base, you gain access to hilarious video files, as well as more information on your crewmates. Information that ranges from lighter stuff like Miranda's failed attempt to find a date through a matchmaking site to darker topics like Samara's last transmission with her children before she took up the mantle of just a car. There is also some gameplay variety introduced in the form of a terrible flying car that pretty much drives itself, but overall, this DLC is an essential part of the Mass Effect 2 experience. I love Mass Effect 2, but even I can't deny that this game is deeply flawed. The story structure aside, it feels like they tried to improve on the gameplay from the first game, but the result was like slapping a band-aid on a knife wound. Scratch that, a more appropriate analogy would be stitching up a knife wound with an unsterilized needle. They closed the wound, but in doing so, they infected the game with a slew of other problems. The removal of the loot system, for instance, fixes the issue of Mass Effect 1's endless bombardment of the player with meaningless weapons and armor items, but it also reduces player customization. One thing that I do need to praise the game for is how self-referential it can be, both in the literal making references to plot lines from the last game and tying up loose ends way, but also in the humorous, we know you hated this so we changed it way. Going into Mass Effect 3, I do feel a sense of anxiety over whether or not the overarching plot of the Reaper threat will be satisfactorily resolved, but I know that I'll always keep the Normandy SR2 screw close to my heart.